So thank you everyone for attending this morning. This is the fourth in our series of water loss control webinars and they are sponsored by the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. So while everyone's getting settled in this morning, we're gonna go over just a few of the Zoom features we're using today. Uh, get you familiar with your screen if you haven't used Zoom that much. Um, so the buttons that we will be using today are kind of highlighted on the bottom of my screen. So it should mimic the bottom of your screen. Uh, so through this session, you will most of the time be muted. Um, and so the mute and unmute button is at the bottom left corner of your screen. And then we'll be using the chat feature for a few things. So if you can find your chat button, get familiar with it, that's where you can ask us questions. You can participate in activities. Uh, you can request clarifications. That's the button you'll use for that. And then the last button that's highlighted there is the reactions button. We're trying something new today. And so um, I just want you to click on your reactions button now and take a look at what's there and see that there's a yes button and a no button. If you wanna go ahead and test it out, you can. Um, but later on this morning, I'm going to ask you to just let me know if the activity um, helped you feel a little bit more prepared for the session today, if you enjoyed the activity, or if you'd prefer not to do something like that, you can use the no button and vote no. Um, but that way we can uh, just get a little bit of an idea about how you feel about the activity. So just wanted to point out the reactions button. Uh, and today we do have James and I both on, on the uh, session. So whenever one of us is busy talking, the other will be able to monitor the chat and monitor the reactions and kind of keep an eye on what's going on. So we're going to take just a minute and practice using the chat, um, the chat box now. So um, if you can, oh, I wanted, I forgot, I wanted to, did want to mention that if you're calling on a phone, on a landline, you're not using the Zoom app on your phone or your computer, then on your landline, you can use star six on your phone to mute or unmute and star nine if you want to raise your hand, if you'd like us to call on you. So that will show up on our screen and then we can unmute, or then you can unmute and we can get your question. So if you're on the phone, uh, and you're not using the app, star six, star nine are gonna be your friends, okay? Now we're gonna practice using the chat feature. So what we would like you to do is use the chat and chat in your name, your organization, your role, and if you could teleport anywhere in the world, where would you go right now? Um, just kind of a fun little get to know you better kind of question. Um, for you to get familiar with that chat box. So go ahead and open chat and tell us your name, your organization, your role. And if you could teleport anywhere in the world, where would you go right now? And I'm gonna go ahead and chat in my answer there. And while folks are doing that, uh, Don, Jesse had a question about the hours uh, available for this class. Uh, I'm sure that's something multiple people might be wondering about. Uh, Absolutely, you do get hours for this class. Um, and if you're an operator and you registered with your operator ID number and your classification that you wanna get credit for, I submit all of that to the state. Um, if you're an engineer or a board member and you need to get credit, uh, you need a attendance certificate, you will need to email me and request the attendance certificate and we'll get it out right away. All right. Um, so that's the two different options. I can't type and talk at the same time, so it took me to get my answer up there. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. We've got we've got some names. So I've got Tim and Joe and Jesse. I've got uh, the Bond de Croft Utility, Cameron Norris Water Commission. I've got Sharon. Um, you'd like to go to a nice beach in the USA. 
that's probably manageable. That maybe wouldn't even take teleportation, <laughs> but teleportation would certainly be nice because then we could just go for an hour and come home. <laughs> I've got James with Paris. That's, that's a nice one, James. <laughs> uh, me with New Zealand. And then I've got uh, the Savannah Water Utility District General Manager. So, all right, we're getting there. I think people are finding their chat features. Um, so go ahead and make sure if you haven't chatted in yet that you do. And uh, Jesse, this class is approved for two hours. So I'll give you just another minute to tell me where you would teleport to if you could teleport anywhere in the world. I guess Jeff Bezos would teleport to space, right, James? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's doing the next best thing, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's only, it is only an 11 minute trip. <laughs> <laughs> it's already over, in fact, right? <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think he's probably down by now, yeah. <laughs> um, so we've got yeah, you can do with lots of money. Screen. So. All right, guys, make sure that if you have questions and you aren't comfortable with the chat or you're not sure how to use it, that you go ahead and use that unmute button and let us know um, what we can do to, you know, make this a little bit easier um, for everyone. So we're going to go ahead and move on, but feel free to keep chatting in your name, your organization, your role. So as I said, this project wouldn't be possible without the vision and the funding from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. This training series and the individual technical assistance that we're providing is available to all of the utilities in the state through this program at no cost, um, absolutely free to anyone that's attending, to anyone that would like assistance. And that wouldn't be possible without TDEC support. Uh, we know that water loss control is definitely an important issue nationally. Uh, and to Tennessee in particular. And it's near and dear to us as well. So we wanna make sure that we thank TDEC for this program. And we wanna thank you guys for attending today as well. So a little bit about us, for those of you that haven't attended any of the training sessions thus far, uh, the group that James and I are with is the Environmental Finance Center, the, sorry, the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. There are environmental finance centers across the country. Uh, and we are located in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, in the University of New Mexico School of Engineering. Our team is a multidisciplinary team, so we have engineers, we have people that focus on water resources, on teaching, on computer programming, on GIS mapping, on accounting, so we've got a wide variety of backgrounds uh, and we cover a wide variety of topics. Today we're um, coming from, to, uh, to you from two different time zones, so James is actually in Albuquerque, um, and soon, I guess, they will we'll be back in the offices. Um, but right now, James is in his home office, and I am in my home office, and that happens to be in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I've been doing this remote employee thing for quite a long time. Um, and so we cover a couple of time zones, and that's uh, uh, helpful to us sometimes with, with clients that are all over the world. So. Um, in the center of the slide here, you can see our mission statement, and it really is what we are all about. We want to develop capacity. We want to develop self-reliance um, in utilities. So we don't want to come in and do it for you. We want to come in and teach you how to do it um, so that you can keep doing it without contracting us back over and over and over again. Uh, so the Southwest EFC has about 15 people right now. Uh, we are rapidly in the process of growing, so we're <laughs> experiencing some of those fun growing pains, um, but it's a nice problem to have. We've, we've uh, been awarded a nice contract, or two contracts that will allow us to grow, so we're excited um, to be growing right now. And then um, what do we focus on? Well, the Southwest EFC really focuses on helping systems to answer the questions about how to pay for technical, financial, and managerial um, you know, problems, issues, concerns uh, for water, wastewater, and now into some stormwater as well. Um, so we're, we provide training on a lot of different topics, uh, but most recently, James and I have been focused on asset management and water loss control. 
And those two really do go hand in hand and we'll make that you know, clear as today's session goes on. Uh, and again, for those of you that haven't been on before, James and I will introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit about us. So again, my name is Dawn Nall and I've been working in the drinking water wastewater field for most of my career. Um, discovered a passion for it when I was actually interning at a plastics plant in college and they put me in the wastewater treatment plant and I thought that it was the end of the world <laughs> and actually ended up falling in love with the environmental side of it and I've tried to make it the focus of my career ever since. Had a brief stint in plastics but we won't talk about that sort of history. Uh, <laughs> we'll focus on the drinking water part <laughs> and then and in my personal life, I also find water to be um, where I find myself, whether it's on the Tennessee River boating or vacationing at the beach or hanging out by the pool. Um, I tend to do all of it. So uh, summertime is my time to, to be alive. <laughs> so uh, definitely um, appreciate clean water and um, well-treated wastewater. So that's my brief history. James, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I've been with the EFC for about six years now. Uh, I also had a prior career. I started out as a lawyer and spent about a decade in operations management. I uh, got over both of those and, and have been in ensconced in the water and engineering world for about the last seven or eight years. Um, my other passion besides chasing down leaks and doing GIS work and asset management is building guitars. I build them a lot better than I play them. The one you can see in the picture there is actually hanging on the wall right behind me right there. Uh, so that's kind of what I do to keep myself sane <laughs> in the off hours. All right, thank you, James. So again, while we're presenting, uh, make sure that you use that chat feature to communicate with us. Um, we want you to use that chat feature for any questions you have at any time. Uh, we don't have a lot of slides that give you opportunities to ask questions. We just want you to ask them as they come up uh, and we'll do our best to get them answered as they come up. Uh, so with that introduction, we're gonna go ahead and dive into today's training. So we're gonna start with going back to the last training session. At the end of the last training session, we provided you with an opportunity to try out a couple of the activities we discussed during that training. So we wanna see how it went. We're gonna go through just a few poll questions. Um, the poll will pop up on your screen and you can just pick the most appropriate answer. You're not getting graded. There's nothing, you know, there's no real right or wrong answer. This is just to get a feel for how it went for you. Um, so we'll leave the question up on the screen for a few seconds and then we'll go ahead and show you the results so you can see, um, you know, how your peers responded as well. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and, and run a few polls here. So the first question is, did you determine whether your utility is using the default values in the water audit software? So this is a quick yes or no, don't know, or if it doesn't apply to you, then go ahead and pick not applicable. And again, these are completely anonymous. We don't know who said what. <laughs> Thanks, James. Somehow or another, I manage to forget that every time. <laughs> <laughs> So Jesse, your, your answer would be not applicable or don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jesse, it's okay that you weren't at the last class. You can either just not vote or you can just say that you don't know because you probably don't know if you're using the defaults or not. So that's fine, whichever way you prefer. We've got six out of seven answers, 100% oh, okay, answered. All right. I will go ahead and share the results then. All right. So most of you aren't sure yet, but um, a couple of you definitely know that you're using the defaults and one of you knows that you're not using the defaults. So that's good news. That's exciting to see that you've determined if you're using the defaults or not. Um, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more today in a, a little bit different capacity than we talked about at last session. Um, you know, specifically to apparent losses and how it can impact your apparent loss calculation. So it's good to know if you're using those defaults or not. All right, James, you want to run the next one? Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you plan to use your own data instead of the defaults for any of the data points in future audits? So if you know you're using those defaults, 
Would you like to switch to using your own data? All right, we're all in. <laughs> so that's a, another good outcome for us to see that yes, you know, you're, you're, you know you're using those defaults, you know you wanna switch to using your own data in the future. Um, that means that your audit's going to become more and more accurate and you're going to have a better understanding of your real loss and your apparent loss. And that can help you kind of make decisions about where to invest and how to spend money to reduce loss. So the more accurate your audit becomes, um, you know, of course, the more information, the better you understand what's going on in your system, the easier it is to make decisions. So we're excited to see those results too. All right, let's go to the next one. So this is just a pick all that apply. So there are three defaults in the audit and we'd like you to pick the ones that you would like to use your own data for instead of using the default values. So in the applied activity, we said, you know, if you're looking at, at switching, which ones would you want to switch? And it could be all three, or it could be that you really wanna focus on one to start. So you can pick one, two, or three answers here. All right, James, I'm not sure that everyone will be able to answer this question adequately. So we'll just go ahead and share the results. So we've got five of you that said unbilled, unmetered, authorized consumption. That's um, probably one of the biggest areas for, um, you know, being able to estimate volumes and, and start to look at your system. Uh, so that's really a good, a good option to start with, systematic data handling errors, unauthorized consumption. Both are also good choices um, in the sense that if we're not looking for loss in those areas, do we really know if it's happening at all, if the default value is anywhere close to what it should be? Um, so definitely good, good information to start digging into. And the last question um, is about the technical assistance that we offer. So it's not anonymous because we can't get in touch with you if you want help, if it is anonymous. So. Uh, the question is just for you to let us know if you'd like to participate in any of that technical assistance. And it can be just a conversation about where you're at with, with um, water loss. It can be a question about how do we calculate this number? How do we do a flow weighted average? Or how do we, you name it, you know, anything to do with water loss, we're healthy. We're healthy. We're <laughs> happy to help you with. <laughs> or healthy if you combine them into one word. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> we're healthy. <laughs> so Jesse made a comment that the fire department uses their fire hydrants and they don't keep records. Um, and that's not an unusual practice, um, but it definitely is. Uh, something for the water utility to express a concern about whether that's, you know, estimating the volumes, was it a large fire, a small fire, how long did the, was the, uh, the hydrant open, so that we can start to account for that water use, so it doesn't show up as real loss, it shows for as accounted um, use instead of loss in our, in our audit. All right, James, I think we can go ahead and close that one. It is closed. All right, thank you. I don't know why on my screen it doesn't, I can't tell. <laughs> uh, it's getting better, but I still don't know that I understand why it does something some ways. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you for your time with the poll. Um, it does help us to kind of know where to focus our efforts with um, you know, speaking and teaching and, and um, 
uh, working with you guys. So what we're going to do today is a little bit different than what we've done in the past. We're going to start out today with a workshop. Um, we want to give you an opportunity to kind of have the learning come to you from the beginning instead of us lecturing from the beginning. So we want to test this out with you and see how it goes. And the activity is going to use Google's Jamboard. Um, and we're going to have you actually go to the website. But before we do that, we're going to give you a preview of what the screen will look like. Um, so the um, Jamboard screen will pop up and we'll have a, a series of questions. And what we're going to ask you to do is to select this pin tool this, that this big orange arrow is pointing at. And when we ask you to vote, you're going to use the pin tool to make a check mark next to the option that you're voting for. Once we're done with the voting, we're going to have you give us some inputs and we're gonna have you give us those inputs on post-it notes. Um, so you'll select this option with a big green arrow to open up a post-it note, type in your comment and then put it on the screen. Um, so that's the, two little uh, icons that you'll need to be familiar with, the pin tool and the post-it tool. I'm going to share it on my screen. Um, James will be in there as well. And um, so if you cannot get to Google's Jamboard and you just stay in Zoom, um, you can use the chat to give us your options, your votes, instead of actually being in the Jamboard itself. We prefer that you go to the Jamboard and participate that way if at all possible, but we understand that for some of you that may not be possible. So feel free to use the chat if that is the case. In the chat, James has shared the link to the Jamboard. Um, so go ahead and open chat and click that link and I am going to get it opened up on my screen now. And it looks like several of you are already here. That's fantastic. Glad to see that. James, is everything sharing okay? Uh, yep, I'm seeing exactly what you're seeing. Uh, All right, perfect. Just little, somebody just put down a B. <laughs> <laughs> So it's All right. So what we're going to do is we're before we Hold get off there. Notes, we're going to start with the pins. So um, we're going to start with the pins and this that so what we want to do here is kind of a choose your own adventure. Um, so I don't know if when you were a young kid, if you read any of those choose your own adventure stories, but I did and I liked them and I always knew that if I got to the end and it wasn't the ending that I wanted if I died or I didn't solve the mystery or I could always go back, right? And choose a different outcome and find out what, how that worked. And so that's what we wanna do here today is um, kind of pick and choose the outcome of what we experience. So what we've got going here is that you happen to be in the front office and a customer comes in to pay for their hydrant meter. So what that means is that um, this utility charges people to use water from the fire hydrants. And they charge, um, they have you pick up a meter, hook it up to the hydrant, and meter how much water you're using. So this person comes in to pay for the meter, and they only pay the base rate, meaning that they're only paying for the rental of the meter itself. They're not paying for any water usage, any volumetric fee. Um, so that's a little unusual, you think, uh, you know, so why would they rent a meter? if they're not actually gonna use it. So that seems a little maybe fishy to you. So now you have the option of saying, okay, what? how would I respond to that? What would I do? And we've got three adventures here for you to choose from. And again, if you can't, if you're not in the Jamboard, it looks like we've got about half of you in the Jamboard and half of you not. So use the chat feature um, to vote A, B, or C if you're not here. If you are here, Go ahead and click on this pin and then come over beside 
the choice that you prefer and you're gonna make a check mark. And I know that making a check mark with a mouse can be a little squirrely. Um, so it doesn't have to be <laughs> a perfect check. It can be whatever, whatever kind of marking works for you. All right. So we've got the check marks on the Jamboard, or do we have any chats coming in? I need to get it open. Not yet. Not yet. So if you're not in the Jamboard, you can chat we've in. We've got another B. I'll put that in there. Great. <clears throat> got one for C. Great. Five out of six, I believe. Well, either way, I think we have a consensus here, don't we? Yes. <laughs> or at least we have a majority, consensus. a majority opinion, actually. That's right, lawyer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it never go it never goes away. <laughs> I, I can't imagine. All right, so if we've if we've voted and we've selected B, we're going to see where the story takes us. So we've got we've got our choices here for option B. So we're going to ask the billing clerk to look into the customer's history, and the billing clerk takes a look. They investigate it, and they show that this particular customer always pays the base rate, and that's it. They're never paying a volumetric fee. So again, maybe a little bit fishy, right? So now what do we do? We've got options one, two, and three. Option one is notify the customer to return it if they're not using it. Quit paying a monthly fee. You're not using it. Why would you keep renting it? Or if they are actually using it, they need to start reporting the volumes that they're using each month. Um, so you're on to them, you know, you're letting them know that, hey, this isn't how this works. And um, we're going to kind of let you know that we're on to you. Or you go out in the field, you take a look, you see if water is actually being taken from the hydrant. Or you ask the billing clerk to flag that customer account and come back next month and take a look and see if they've paid any volumetric fees this next month. Because maybe this month they just had a weird month that, you know, someone was sick and they didn't end up doing any dust control or construction got halted for some reason. So maybe this was just an off month. And so you're going to ask the billing clerk to flag it, check and see if they pay any volumetric fees next month. So again, grab your pen and put a check mark next to one, two, or three as to which outcome you would like to, to have. And I just put Tim's vote in for number two. Thank you. All right, any more votes? Grab your pen and give me a check mark. Looks like we had one more last time than this time. So I'll give you just a second here. All right, thank you. And you guys are anonymous. I don't know who's who. You're different animals. So <laughs> I don't know who's voting how. So um, all right, so we've got the majority here is to go out in the field and see if any water is actually being taken from the hydrant. So if that is the adventure that we're taking, now we have an outcome. So we're going to see how this story ends. Um, so the outcome to our story is that we have this immediate knowledge, right? We go out in the field and we have immediate knowledge if theft is occurring or if they're not actually using any water. And so either scenario we could address immediately because now we know if we've got theft or if we've just got a customer that wasn't using water this month. So what we're gonna do now is say, okay, so we've gotten to the end of this story. We have an outcome. We've got this immediate knowledge. How does that impact our utility? So we're gonna take a look at 
Um, the slides at the top, the frames at the top have the little arrows and we're going to go to the last frame. So frame six is where you need to go. So moving on those little arrows at the top until you get to frame six and it should say outcome immediate knowledge. All right, so once you're on frame six, what we're gonna do now is use our post-it notes. So you're gonna click on the thing that says sticky note, the little icon four down on your toolbar and a box will pop up. And what we want you to do is type in that box the impact that having that this outcome has on one of the things in the boxes below. So I'm gonna hide that again. So how does it impact the revenue for the utility if you know if there was theft or not? Or how would it impact customer service? Or how would it impact your water loss control um, or your system knowledge? So you know any of these environmental impacts is the one I didn't mention. So <laughs> it can impact all of these in different ways. So you would pick your sticky note and for the sake of giving you an example, I would say if we have immediate knowledge of theft or non-use, I'm going to say for customer service, the customers pay for it one way or the other. And I'm gonna click save. I'm gonna post it's gonna pop up there and I'm gonna move it under customer service impacts. So you guys click the little sticky note and tell me what you think the impacts are by knowing immediately. So, you know, had we chosen one of the other adventures where we flagged the account or we didn't take it into consideration at all because it wasn't our job, it would have a different impact, a different outcome, a different impact. So what are those impacts to your utility? And again, if you're not in the Jamboard, feel free to use the chat and we can put it in the Jamboard for you. That's a good one. Assuming that you caught the theft, you can start collecting money for the water that might not have been recorded in prior months. That's absolutely correct. So it does have an impact on your revenue immediately, right? You caught it, you know what's happening, and you can address it. And you can bill the customer for the water used, but not billed. So that one definitely goes under revenue impacts, but it probably goes over here on water loss impacts as well, because now if you're billing something that wasn't billed before, that changes your water loss, right? That changes your audit, it changes the outcomes of your water loss control. Um, so you can estimate what was stolen in prior months. That's, you're in my head, I think. <laughs> We've got the cost impact on the chemicals, the time, the electric, absolutely. What if you go out there and that customer is running that hydrant just wide open, doesn't care that it's running when they're filling the truck or when it's not, doesn't care that it's dripping and running into the creek right next, next to the hydrant. What are the possible environmental impacts of someone that doesn't care about how they're using that water at the hydrant? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Water hammer for possible main breaks. Yep. So person that's using the hydrant, maybe irresponsibly just slams it open, slams it closed. We get that water hammer. We know water hammer leads to main breaks. So now we maybe have a little bit more understanding about why we had more breaks since this contractor's come on the job <laughs> than before, right? So 
So these are all good answers. And I'm going to give you guys just another um, minute here to kind of think about, you know, some of the other impacts that you might see and have and understand as soon as you know that there's theft happening at your hydrant. Yep, possible runoff into the streams, possible flooding from the overflow. Absolutely. What might your customers think if there's water running down the street all the time? Yep, yep. So when a customer sees that water running down the street, they think you don't care about water, why should I, right? If the utility wastes water, why, why do I care about conserving? Why do I care if my toilet's leaking? Why do I care, you know? So, um, so absolutely. Or other customers that would be like me, says, man, that utility's got a problem. <laughs> he needs to fix something. <laughs> Don't come to me with a rate increase. That's right. <laughs> you better fix your leaky pipes before you charge me more. <laughs> I am a KUB customer, so you know you guys don't have to worry. <laughs> All right. So I think we've got some good outcomes for this scenario. Let's go back to our first screen with our possible stories. And let's say, okay, we had a vote for C. So if we had C take place, where would we end if we had C take place? So we asked the billing clerk to flag that account on the billing system. And we're gonna keep tabs on the situation. We're gonna come back and take a look next month and see what happens. Um, so the outcome here is that we're kind of in this wait and see mode, right? And we're gonna revisit the issue next month. So if we, if we took that adventure, um, it would have different impacts on our utility than if we had this immediate knowledge outcome where we landed the first time. So we put our finger in the book, we came back, now we're gonna check out the other routes, the other adventures we can go on. Um, and just kind of real quick, let's go ahead and go to um, the third screen and use our post-it notes to think about how the impacts would be different for our utility if we decided to wait and see and revisit the issue next month. How would that be different for our revenue, for our water loss, for our customer service, any of these? So again, use your post-it note. We're not going to stick here too long because we do need to be moving along here. Just a couple minutes, but I just wanted to kind of get you to think the different outcomes have different impacts. How might those be different? Grab your post-it note. Tell me one way that it would be different if we chose this route. So again, here's your post-it note. I just saw a new icon pop up. So here's your sticky note. It pops up, you type, you hit save, and then your post-it note shows up. So you might use the time to see if there are other hydrant accounts with no volumetric use. So while you're waiting, you say, hey, maybe this isn't the only one that's doing this. Maybe we should be flagging all of these accounts that have zero use and checking on those. We'd have unknown water loss for previous months. That's correct. And that's gonna impact both your revenue and your water loss, right? So that one would, we need to, Stretch it, <laughs> stick it here and over here on the side. We don't get any money that month for the, for the volume that that customer may be using. That's absolutely correct.
So there are different impacts. We have the possibility of getting revenue right away, or we have the possibility of waiting and seeing, but maybe gaining more system knowledge, maybe, um, you know, kind of saying this customer maybe is unique and this month they just had an issue. So we're gonna, we're gonna give it a month and we're gonna see what's going on. Um, there really are reasons to take every one of those actions that's up there, every one of those adventures. Um, and, but thinking through what the impacts are, um, especially you know, with your water loss and your revenue um, on these apparent losses, this is definitely revenue related. And that's what we're gonna spend some time talking about here in just a minute. Um, so I'm going to give James a second to get set up. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask you guys to use that reactions button and let me know, yes or no, was this a good activity? Does it get you thinking before our presentation today? Did you like the exercise? So that reactions button at the bottom, you can give me the yes or the no. Um, and let me know what you thought about the activity. Got a thumbs up. Great. Thanks, Tony. Can you confirm I've got the right screen showing? You certainly do. And I haven't seen any more reactions come in, but that's okay. They can still come in while you're getting started, James. So feel free to take it away. All righty. Uh, so we're going to uh, sort of, now that we sort of set the stage a little bit with, uh, with some exercises, we're going to do a quick overview or review of non-revenue water and apparent losses, uh, some of their sources, how they fit into the audit, and then how they fit into water loss control uh, in general. So uh, you all have been using water audits to calculate non-revenue water. And just as a quick review, our non-revenue water has three basic components. There's the authorized unbilled part. That's what you're giving away on purpose uh, with, with knowledge and foresight. Um, there are real losses, so tank overflows, mainline breaks, background leakage, things like that. Uh, and then in between, we've got these apparent losses, which more or less come from systematic data handling errors, customer metering inaccuracies, and then unauthorized usage, which is the nice way of saying theft. Uh, and it's this category that's going to be our focus uh, today. So what do these three categories all have in common? Well, the picture here, I think, is a hint. Um, apparent losses are kind of like ghosts or phantoms because they're not physical. Uh, they look like losses on paper, at least initially, uh, but they're not the result of water leaking out of your system. What they really represent is water that was delivered to customers, or in the case of theft, a potential customer. Uh, and these deliveries, for one reason, reason or another, just weren't counted and therefore didn't generate uh, any revenue for you. And apparent losses, if they're not identified, can introduce a degree of error into the consumption data in your audit. And that can really distort your picture of what's going on because of the way the audit works. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in depth as we go on. But basically, what the audit's trying to do is tally up your source volume and subtracting your consumption from that. And then whatever is left over is loss of one kind or another. So um, because of the methods for reducing apparent loss are different from those that you use to address real losses, you really wanna make sure that you have a solid understanding of what's going on in your system so that you can apply the right tools for your particular loss problem or more likely problems. Uh, if you have an apparent loss problem uh, that you have misidentified as a real loss problem and you use, for example, leak detection to address that, nothing about your apparent losses is going to change. You know, you might obviously gain some valuable information about pipe condition. You might reduce the real losses, which is a positive, uh, but leak detection as a, as a tool is not going to impact apparent losses at all. It's basically the wrong tool for the job. Um, so we're going to address the three categories of apparent loss that are in the audit in a slightly different audit order than they show up. And we're going to start with, with systematic data handling errors. So 
for those of you who are maybe a little less familiar with the audit, what we mean by this are you know, the billing system quirks, the data archiving and retrieval errors, the meters that aren't in the system, uh, reporting issues, analysis errors. These are the kinds of things that are often the most hard to find because they typically require some in-depth research into the systems themselves, like your billing system software, sometimes even hardware, or maybe your SCADA hookups or your AMI setup, you know, that's transmitting data from your meters in, into your main system. Um, I'll give you two examples of, of this kind of error. Um, we had a system that we were working with a few years ago back east. They had an industrial customer with a very, very large meter, uh, and the setup was done incorrectly. So for every hundred gallons, uh, that this customer got, the utility accounted and billed for one, because basically in the conversion from meter to billing system, the decimal point was in the wrong place. And this went on for several years before it was happened. That's a systematic data handling error. It's something that's happening routinely in the background because of the way the data is flowing that you're not seeing and it's costing you money. And note, you know, it's not that the water's not getting to the customer, they're getting the water, you're just not getting the revenue for it. A similar but slightly different example comes uh, from one of the systems we worked with out in the U.S. territories. Uh, there we had a customer uh, utility with a customer with a 10 inch meter on a small office building that only had a few people in it at any given time. The meter was there for fire flow, but it wasn't a compound meter. Uh, and because it was so big and the typical use in that building was, you know, filling up a pot for the tea kettle or flushing a toilet, um, you know, the flow wasn't even uh, strong enough to get that 10 inch meter to spin. Uh, so basically, this was a situation where uh, no volumetric usage was ever recorded. It was a hardware issue, uh, but same sort of thing. It's going on in the background, uh, and the result is you're not getting paid. The second category uh, of apparent loss in the audit is customer meter error. Everybody has some degree of customer meter error. Uh, they typically uh, under-registered. The question really is how much? Uh, and given that you've only got one field in the audit to populate for all of your customer meter error, and most systems will have multiple meter sizes and different classes and quite often different ages of meters, um, this is something that is really hard to determine if you don't have any test data. And a lot of systems, even very big sophisticated systems, don't have very good meter test data. Uh, and honestly, even if your meters are new, uh, some amount of low flow is often not going to be picked up, and there's always going to be zero reads from stuck meters and inadequate estimates. Um, another type of meter error might be related to whether you actually have the active meter in your billing system. Uh, we were doing an asset inventory for a system here a few years ago in New Mexico, uh, and they were in, area, in an area where there was a ton of new construction going on. Uh, and because of some sort of internal process issues, they were setting meters out in the field and not getting all of them into their uh, billing software. Uh, and when we did an audit of their meter population, we found that despite the fact that they were all relatively new and accurate, about 3% of them weren't actually in the billing system and therefore weren't generating any revenue. That's obviously an extreme example, but that's something that had you know, a significant impact on the accuracy of the consumption data for that system's audit, and also a significant impact on the revenue stream for that system. And of course, you know, your inventory might be better, but having 3% of your meters not be in the billing system is effectively the same as having an average meter error of 3%. In either case, uh, you're basically not getting paid for 3% of your deliveries. And if you don't know that's happening, uh, it makes it really hard to compensate for and also might lead you to some incorrect conclusions about where your loss problems are. Uh, because if you don't know it's meter error, it's going to look like real loss. And last but not least, you've got theft. Um, you know, theft is in this category because even stolen water goes to a potential customer and it represents uh, a loss of revenue, not a real loss. Um, it's not water leaking out of the pipe, it's water that's being stolen. And of course, in many ways, this is the hardest of these three categories to get a handle on because if the theft is being done well, by definition, you're not gonna be aware of it. And, and as we all know, uh, people get very, very creative. Um, and a lot of systems that we uh, work with think that theft is a relatively small problem and therefore they don't really spend any time tracking it. Um, and again, it is hard to estimate, but we'll talk a little bit more about some reasons why you might want to do that. The main reason being uh, sort of confirming your, your assumptions uh, about what's going on and also just sort of establishing a baseline. Um, so now we've got 
an idea about the three categories of apparent loss that we're talking about. Um, let's look at the audit and where it's reported. Um, so all of your water losses basically show up in the bottom section here. Um, they're grouped together in one section. You've got systematic data handling errors there. You've got customer metering and accuracies there and unauthorized consumption. I want you to notice a couple of things about this. First off, all those fields are yellow, which basically means, at least if you're using the defaults, uh, the audit is calculating them for you. Um, you can override these uh, over here. You know, you have the opportunity to either change the percentages here, if you know what they are, or if you've done a volumetric calculation, uh, you can check one of these boxes and, and put that volume in there and adjust that. Um, but I think our, our poll question demonstrated that, you know, uh, a lot of folks are using uh, the defaults and that's perfectly okay. Uh, we'll see some statistics from the state of Tennessee here in a little bit. Um, uh, but um, good thing to remember is that, you know, all of these represent customer deliveries that you're not getting revenue for. So we're basically talking about cash being left on the table. And the defaults here are really just sort of first order approximations that are typically going to need some refinement. Uh, our sort of perspective is if you don't have any data, using the defaults is fine. Uh, but if you can economically collect something uh, to sort of compare those default values against, uh, that's typically a very good idea. Um, Again, you can update those percentages. Those are the two defaults that we're talking about. Uh, a lot of folks don't change them because uh, when you open the audit up, that's already filled out for you. And again, these are these are hard things to, to calculate on your own. Um, the other thing to really remember is that apparent loss is directly tied to real losses. Um, apparent losses are essentially a real loss adjustment. Um, you know, the audit calculates your uh, real losses by taking your consumption, uh, excuse me, your supply, subtracting all of the consumption out of it, and then adjusting that consumption uh, to reflect known apparent losses. And whatever is left over is going to be showing up as real loss. So, um, you know, basically what we're trying to get a handle on here is consumption that typically goes unseen and unrecorded. And obviously, if you underestimate those real losses without making any other change, is that underestimated volume is going to show up looking like real loss in your audit, and vice versa, of course. Um, so, you know, again, it is a good idea to have an understanding of which is which, because uh, depending on the, the mechanics of your system and how your how old your meters are and how your billing system is set up, and maybe the economics. Uh, currently going on in, in your area, um, you can have very, very different looking outcomes. There is really no standard uh, audit outcome. Um, so I've got a good understanding here, I think, of sort of the relationship uh, and how they are related, but they are treated differently. And by they, I mean apparent losses and real losses in one big respect. Um, <clears throat> and that's about how they're valued. Um, I think this picture comparison up here is a little bit of extreme, you know, dollars to pennies, um, but it does make a point. Uh, real losses are typically valued at your variable production cost. Uh, so the pipes leak a bit, you have to treat extra water to keep them full and pressurized. So real losses, one way of thinking about them is they're kind of a cost of doing business. Uh, and the typical cost for treating a unit of water is relatively low. So you know, variable production cost is typically going to be uh, very, very small. That's the left side of the picture. The right-hand side, we're talking about apparent losses and lost revenue. Customer got the water, you just didn't get paid. Uh, so when you're thinking about apparent losses, you're looking at retail value. Um, apparent losses are always valued at the retail cost. And it's because of that difference in valuation that a relatively small amount of apparent loss can really have a big uh, dollar impact uh, on your operation. And I think these next two graphs really demonstrate this clearly. These are from a recent audit that we did. Um, and on the left-hand side of the screen, you've got the losses in the various categories of non-revenue water by volume. And on the right-hand side, we've got the costs. Uh, and this is you know, part of the, the, the water audit tabs. If you haven't looked at these in your own system, I highly suggest that you uh, recommend that you do. Um, and what this really shows us is this group here that I've, I've uh, highlighted, which is essentially 
unauthorized consumption, theft, customer metering inaccuracies, and systematic data handling errors in this particular system are relatively small. If you look at them in comparison uh, to the real losses, it's about a quarter, uh, so maybe 26, 27%. But if you look at the cost associated with that, um, uh, the combined cost of those three small categories of uh, apparent loss is essentially equal to the cost of the real losses. And that's because of the different ways that we're valuing them. You know, we're uh, valuing the real losses at variable production cost. We're valuing the apparent losses at uh, customer retail costs. Now, if you really want to make somebody's eyes pop open, uh, you may have already noticed this, the audit has the ability to value your real losses at customer retail unit cost. There's a checkbox on the main <clears throat> uh, data input screen uh, that lets you do that. And some states have actually taken that approach. For example, the state of Oklahoma uh, basically values uh, all real losses at customer retail unit cost because Oklahoma, like New Mexico here, we're in the desert Southwest uh, and they want people to take those losses very, very seriously. So uh, which is the appropriate way to do it is a debate for another day. But if you do wanna get somebody's attention about your real losses, uh, flip that switch and value them at customer retail uh, costs and it will usually get uh, people to uh, open their eyes. So now we've kind of gone through the audit. Let's look at some uh, tenancy statistics. Uh, we're going to look at some volumes and we're going to look at some values and we're going to look at validity um, uh, in the state of Tennessee because you know your state has for a number of years been requiring water audits. So there's actually some good information out there uh, that we can pull from. So if you look at non-revenue water as a percent of supply, uh, this is a couple year old statistics, uh, but they haven't changed much. Um, it shows that in Tennessee, we're kind of all over the map. There are some systems that have very, very low non-revenue water, you know, the minimum is 3%. Um, some are very high. There's at least one system out there with 68% non-revenue water, um, but the average is around uh, 30%. Now, um, this points out a couple of things. One being that um, there's probably some issues with the data. Uh, some of the information that I went through was obviously wrong and, and had to be excluded. But what this shows us is that there's a broad uh, range uh, when it comes to non-revenue water in, in the state of Tennessee. But it's important to remember that non-revenue water also includes water that you are giving away on purpose. So that unbilled authorized use. Um, so this is an incomplete picture of what's going on. If we wanna look at just apparent losses, uh, we can essentially take those uh, unbilled authorized uses out uh, and then just look at apparent losses as a percentage of total loss. And here again, we've got this really, really wide spread. Um, we've got, you know, from less than half of a percent up to almost 90%. Um, so uh, in one end, you know, it's a, it's a very small percentage. At the other end, it's the vast majority. And of course, you know, there's likely to be some data error here. Uh, again, as I said, some of the data was obviously wrong and had to be purged. Uh, but the point I'm making here is that uh, systems at the opposite end of the spectrum are going to have to take different actions to address their problems uh, and are also going to have very different potential revenue impacts because we're only looking at half of the losses here or part of the losses. The other half is the real loss. So if you were to compare the system on the left versus the system in the middle, the system on the right, um, they've all got uh, very different uh, loss profiles. Uh, the system on the left-hand side is almost entirely real loss. The system on the right-hand side is almost entirely apparent loss. And they're going to have uh, different tools that they use to remedy uh, those problems. So this is, again, what I was talking about at the very beginning, the idea of you know understanding what those apparent losses are because they can have a real impact on the total real loss that the audit calculates and therefore the remedies that you want to uh, apply. Um, so that's looking at losses at a percentage uh, basis. Uh, let's look at them on a normalized basis. So on a gallons uh, per service connection per day. Um, again, this reflects a very broad spread. Uh, we've got, you know, 0.15 gallons to almost 35 gallons uh, with an average of about five and a half. 
Um, the good thing about this is if we compare this to the AWWA's benchmark median for this particular category, overall, the state of Tennessee is doing very, very well. You know, five and a half gallons versus a benchmark median of 8.4 gallons per connection uh, per day. Um, but again, we've got these, this broad spread. You know, we've got some systems, obviously, that are on the very, very high end of things. Um, you know, the, the largest one here being almost five times the AWWA benchmark median. But of course, this only shows the volume side of things. That's only half the picture. The other half is the money. Um, so, you know, apparent losses are about volume, yes, but they're very, very much more about revenue. Uh, revenue is being left on the table, essentially. Uh, if we look at that apparent loss per connection value, the average is about 15, a little over $15 per connection uh, per year. Uh, the highest one I could find that seemed to have reasonable data was about $104 per connection per year. Um, and a thing to think about here is, you know, this is an apples to apples kind of um, comparison, except for the fact that obviously different systems are gonna have different customer retail unit costs. Some systems are gonna charge more, some systems are gonna charge less. That might be because of the cost of production or just, for whatever reason, um, but if you're one of those systems that has volumetric sewer rates that are based on your potable water consumption, it really behooves you to look into this uh, because that can change the financial out, uh, outlook considerably. I've been working with an Arizona system here for the past year and a half or so that has a potable water uh, retail unit cost of about 450 uh, per thousand gallons. And that's what they did their initial analysis with but they also base their sewer revenue on volumetric water use. So when we factored the sewer side of things in, um, that uh, customer retail unit cost was actually over $9. Um, so before factoring in that sewer range, they were essentially only looking at half of their potential losses from apparent loss. You know, they were looking at it in terms of, you know, we're losing 450 per thousand gallons and not thinking about the back end of things, literally, uh, the sewer side, where every you know thousand gallons of water that wasn't uh, calculated on the potable water side was resulting in another four and a half dollars uh, and change uh, of sewer revenue that was lost. So it's a really good idea to look at these things. And if you're thinking about uh, where your apparent losses might be, um, you know, think about how many customers you have. Uh, look at these kind of numbers and and see what the basic math tells you. Um, if we look at the average apparent loss in Tennessee, it's about $83,000 across all of the systems that have uh, audits uh, per, per, per system. Now, obviously big systems are gonna have much higher loss, lower systems are gonna have uh, potentially much lower loss, um, but um, it's a relatively big number. And uh, you know, it's even at $84,000 or $83,000, it's not chump change. Um, so, you know, is this number accurate? Probably not. Um, I had to do some cleanup in the audit results, uh, again, because uh, some of the values that were in the state's data kind of didn't make sense. Um, but the point here is that even small systems can have significant revenue loss left on the table due to apparent losses. Um, and you really need to think about, you know, why Tennessee has you doing the audit and why you're doing the audit. You know, Tennessee has two requirements around the audit. Uh, they need a minimum data validity score of 81 and non-revenue water has to be less than 20% by cost of operating system. That's what they're looking at. Uh, and so when I was looking through that data, uh, all of that data met these criteria, but some of it was honestly somewhat unrealistic, you know, whether that was done uh, by accident or on purpose. Um, so, you know, when you're doing these audits, you got to remember that, you know, the Tennessee State of Tennessee is reviewing your audit, looking to verify that you meet these mandated standards. Um, if you want the audit to be useful to you and actionable beyond sort of a routine thing that you have to do every year to check a box so that you don't have to go see the comptroller, um, you do have to do some analysis and dig a little bit deeper because your system goals are gonna be different. You know, At a fair minimum, um, you'd wanna be understanding the real and apparent losses in your system to see whether they're within an acceptable range, uh, not only for the state, but for you and your customer base and, 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 and your business. Um, so, um, you know, uh, 
use the audit obviously to meet those state requirements, but um, it's a really good idea to put some work into it and, and use it to understand what's going on in your system so that you can guide your actions uh, and then track how the actions that you're taking are actually impacting those real and apparent losses. Um, so that in a very big nutshell is the three categories of apparent loss and the audit. Um, now, obviously uh, how you're gonna be able to impact them is gonna depend entirely on how you address them. And there's actually four approaches to uh, addressing apparent loss controls. And you're probably thinking, you know, wait, you just said there's three categories. Why are there four approaches? Um, this will make sense in a second. Um, on the authorized, unauthorized consumption side, the theft, um, you know, anybody getting uh, water for free is a potential customer. Um, we can address this by tracking instances of theft. You know, you can change meter reading days in an effort to catch theft. You can do field verifications of zero reads and the like. There are some you know, process mechanisms you can put in uh, that will catch at least some of this. Uh, on the customer metering and accuracy side of things, you know, we can address this uh, by doing meter testing programs so that we have an understanding of, you know, to what extent our meters are under-reading or over-reading in some cases. Um, we can do meter replacement. Uh, so there are, again, uh, activities that we can uh, use to address this part of apparent losses. On the systematic data handling errors, there's actually two different approaches. Uh, and that's because there's essentially two different places that errors can happen here. Uh, the first of which is the data transfer essentially from meters to archives. So, uh, you know, this is like the, the kind of errors I was talking about at the beginning, uh, where information isn't getting into your billing system from the meters. Um, uh, this is the kind of error you would also get if you happen to have me as your manual meter reader, because I habitually transpose the digits one and three, and quite often write 13 when I mean, mean 31. It's a systematic error. It's a manual error, but it's systematic. Um, and this type of error results in both lost revenue and under-recorded consumption. The other kind of error is sort of on the back end, and these are essentially errors that happen between the archives and the water balance. Um, and this is a subtle distinction, but I think this example will clarify things. Um, we had a system that uh, archived data when an account changed hands during the year. So the, the old account uh, got archived. And of course, they had issues with under registration and things like that, like every other customer had, but they had a good handle on their meter error. But in their case, um, they had a systematic data error that impacted the audit, but not the revenue. Um, and that error was the result of how that archived consumption data was collected at the end of the year and pulled out for reporting and for auditing. Because no matter how much water uh, the archive customer had used, the end of year archive report query returned 4,000 gallons per customer per year because the report was set up wrong. And nobody noticed this because the query was buried in a summary consumption report. So at the end of the year, they basically had a couple of categories. They ran a crystal report and it pulled this information out. And because they were just looking at summary data, they didn't actually see uh, the issue. They knew something was wrong, but they couldn't figure it out. So this is an error that didn't impact revenue. They'd been paid. You know, while that customer was active, everything was working correctly. They were getting billed. Uh, customers were paying. The payments were getting recorded. Um, but their end of year query for the audit basically didn't account for all of the water that had been paid for. Uh, and so it buggered up their consumption numbers, uh, messed up the meter error correction, because when they were doing the meter error correction, they weren't running that against the entire volume of water that had been um, calculated or been consumed. Um, and then that consumption number was short because it artificially, you know, and then as a result, that overestimated real loss. So this is an example, not only of how things can go wrong, but why you also want to look at raw data and not just summary data. You know, the system knew something was wrong, but it couldn't figure out what was going on because they were just looking at the totals. Um, and when I couldn't figure it out either, I had them pull raw data and then we started looking at that. And then the issue became super, super clear because as we looked at the re individual results of that query, it was obvious that not everybody was only using 4,000 gallons. So subtle distinction, but there's essentially two sides to the systematic data handling errors uh, that you have to look into. So, you know, I said that apparent loss is very much about the money. Uh, and in that sense, it's really important to understand what's actually possible with apparent loss reductions. Uh, 
And just like real loss, um, you can't recover everything. Um, there's gonna be some volume of the parent loss uh, that you're just not gonna be able to get back. Um, so if this box represents the total amount of apparent losses you have there, there's gonna be some that you can actually get back relatively economically. Um, you know, in other words, you'll get back the cost to recover plus something. Um, and this is generally the area you're gonna to wanna to focus on uh, because the whole goal here is to achieve an economically acceptable level of losses in general and apparent losses in specific. So, um, you know, some you're gonna be able to recover uneconomically. So in other words, you know, you might be spending a dollar to, to save 90 cents. And although that might seem counterintuitive, um, there are reasons why that approach might be taken. Uh, if for example, uh, at least on paper, you're running up against the state's loss threshold, you might take some actions that are cost, gonna cost you more than they re, uh, the return in the short term, uh, like maybe meter change outs or something like that. Uh, because you've got another issue to worry about. You know, you don't want to have to go talk to the comptroller. Um, and then there's going to be some amount of, of volume of apparent loss that you're just not going to be able to recover. And that's because nothing's perfect. People steal, errors get made, meters break. Um, there's no way uh, to, to get everything. Um, this last category is referred to as unavoidable annual apparent loss. Might sound vaguely familiar because in the audit on the real loss side, we've got an unavoidable avoidable annual real loss uh, formula that we can use. Uh, there's no empirical formula for calculating the unavoidable annual apparent loss, uh, you know, what it should be under any given set of circumstances. Obviously, every situation is gonna be different uh, and every system is gonna have a break even point after which the remedy costs more than the problem, um, but that's gonna be situation specific. And that's okay, because as long as you can quantify what's going on, you can address it. And the big point I'm making here is that your goal should be to identify the nature and quantity and cost of your apparent losses before you actually try and tackle them. Um, you know, figure out what's going on first, then develop the control strategy. Um, and you know, most systems are using the defaults uh, because they don't have you know the data to to uh, to use that's specific to their system. And you know that's okay, but you have to understand that the result is that you don't really have a com real complete picture of what's going on with apparent losses and real losses. What you have is an approximation uh, and it might be a good approximation or it might be a not so good approximation. Um, and we talked a little bit last session about uh, reasons for not using the defaults and I'm gonna kind of continue that conversation a little bit here. Um, again, I said, you know, a lot of systems, they don't track theft because it's viewed as a relatively small problem. Um, and so it doesn't get tracked systematically. And of course the audit gives you an out. Um, and in the absence of real data, that's a great place to start. Uh, but you might want to reevaluate that process. And the reason why is because the audit default is an estimate. Um, to use this as an analogy, you know, a lot of shoemakers only offer medium width shoes. You know, they're all size D and that works for most people. But if you're like me and you've got uh, triple E feet or yours are really narrow, those shoes are only gonna kind of work. The audit defaults are sort of equivalent to the medium width. Uh, they were developed by a group of experts. Um, uh, they might work for you, but they might not. Uh, it's a one size fits most. And really the only way to determine whether it's in the right ballpark for you is to try and gather some data to compare against them. Um, in Tennessee, 94% of systems use the default for unauthorized consumption. So if you're using it, uh, don't feel bad, you're not alone. Um, overall, it is a relatively small piece of the water audit. And if you're just starting out, um, there are often bigger fish to fry, you know, getting your source volumes uh, nailed down, getting uh, your meter error nailed down, uh, things like that, tracking all of your unbilled use. Um, so, uh, but recognize that it's small, but it can be important. And as you go through uh, and get better at developing audits, uh, tracking theft uh, might be worth doing. And it's, it's a relatively easy thing to do. Uh, you don't have to initially, when you start out, even worry about uh, trying to track volume, uh, just having a way to record instances uh, is, is a good way to start to see whether this is an, even an issue in your system uh, that you need to address. 
some thoughts on uh, why you might want to use the default percentages uh, or tracked occurrences. Um, you know, in the audit context, like I said, if you don't have something to compare it to, uh, you're basically just guessing. Um, here's some thoughts from us on why not to use the defaults. Again, it's hard to know what's going on if you don't look. Um, having some data will allow you to do trend analysis over time, even if you're not looking at volumes, but instances, you know, is theft increasing, decreasing, is it staying the same? Uh, you can start trying to figure out whether there's any relations uh, with other things that are going on in your community that you might be able to address. Um, you know, if you don't have any data, it's really impossible to know whether you need to do any theft control. Uh, and like the audit in general, I think, you know, this is one of those opportunities to sort of examine policies and procedures and practices uh, that are part of the data grading process to see whether what you're doing uh, makes sense under the current circumstances. You know, in many cases, we do things a certain way because we've always done them that way. Uh, and that may be fine, but it might not. Uh, other things, particularly thinking about that, that minimum data grade requirement, if you're using your own data, you can possibly get higher than a five on this data point. Uh, if you are using the default, uh, five is the highest you can go, I and mean, that's what you're going to get. Um, and again, you know, theft is also a security and health risk. Uh, you need some information to be able to understand that. Um, so just some general thoughts on, on why you might want to do that. On the customer meter error side, as I said, you know, everybody's got some degree of meter error. And a lot of systems take manufacturers' words for accuracy, uh, you know, trusting without verifying, particularly when they're putting in new meters. Um, but it's important to understand that even with new meters, some amount of low flow is not going to get picked up. Uh, you know, you're also typically going to have zero reads from stuck meters. You know, does your billing system flag those? Do you do anything about them when they're flagged? Uh, here in Albuquerque, you know, we're in the desert. Uh, our utility had a xeroscaping promotion where they actually subsidized uh, some xeroscaping. They would help you, you know, pay you a little bit to pull lawns out and I took advantage of that and put in a whole bunch of drippers uh, for some small xeriscape um, uh, areas around my house. And the one thing I noticed after I did that is when those drippers were running, my meter did not turn. It was a relatively old meter, older meter, probably eight to 10 years old. Uh, but its specs were such that, you know, these half a gallon an hour drippers just did not register at all. So I could have let that thing run all day and never paid a cent for it. Um, so, um, you know, think about causes in your system and, and also how you might go about uh, addressing them and identifying what the, what the magnitude of the issue is. Uh, and one way to think about this is to sort of just walk through uh, a scenario of, you know, what happens uh, if customer meters, let's say, under register on, on average at 2% and you don't know it. Well, the first thing is that your losses are going to increase by that amount um, because if you can't account for the under registration, um, you're starting from a deficit. You essentially just lost 2% of your sold volume um, because of that under registration. Um, that would be magnified even more if you were over reporting your production outputs too. So if your source volume is too high, you just made things even worse. Um, the underreported piece obviously looks like loss because you can't account for it. It's water that's going into the system, but that on paper at least doesn't appear to be coming out through any uh, consumption channel. Obviously, it's not disappearing. You're just not recording it. So, you know, you're not getting paid. You've got that revenue implication. You're paying to treat that water and deliver it. But it's not showing up on the books. Um, and it looks like you've got real losses that you don't, which is obviously going to drive your lost and unaccounted for water. Uh, or excuse me, your, your, your state reporting uh, loss is higher uh, and, and is going to look uh, worse in terms of real loss in your audit. So where does that go? Um, well, it really depends on whether you can identify the source of the loss. If you can account for the meter error, it shows up as apparent loss. If you can't, it shows up at real loss. So simplified audit here, this one happens to be an acre feet it's from one that I did recently. Um, input volumes, roughly 100,000. Uh, acre feet build metered volumes about 90,000 acre feet. Um, total loss 10,000 acre feet. If you can't adjust for real losses, uh, i.e., there's no corrections for that, um, all of it looks like real loss. If you can adjust for it, um, well, 
6,000 uh, acre feet of that is due to meter error. So now you've got a real loss of only about 4,000 uh, acre feet. So this changes your perspective, both in terms of how much your losses are worth, uh, because all of the losses at variable production, uh, uh, all of the real losses at variable production rate are probably not gonna be uh, nearly as high as they are when it's split and some of it's at retail. Um, so, um, you know, hopefully this demonstrates that, you know, knowing uh, where your losses are occurring can be really beneficial. Because again, looking at the real loss side of things would have potentially pushed you down the, the wrong road in terms of trying to uh, uh, reduce that. Um, another thing to think about is just like supply meter testing, um, if you're collecting test data on your customer meters, just knowing that they pass isn't really good enough. Um, AWWA has some sort of acceptability thresholds for customer meters. Uh, it's a fairly wide range. I think what's 98% what's to 101% is, is okay. Um, and a lot of systems, you know, they'll test meters and as long as they're in that slot uh, or in that range, they'll put them down as pass and, and, and indicate that they're 100% you know, accurate. And that's not really true. Um, you know, a 2% plus or minus error is, is, is a pretty wide swing. Um, so if you're going to do tests, make sure you keep granular test data. You know, how many meters were tested? What sizes were they? Um, why were they tested? Because you know, doing random sampling gives you different results than if you're only going out and looking at stop meter reports. You know, stop meter reports gives you information on uh, the cohort of stop meters. It doesn't necessarily give you good information about your entire cohort of meters. Um, you know, what's the right sample size for your system? Uh, what sort of confidence level can you actually calculate with the data that you have? Um, you know, how do those tested meters compare to the general meter population? Uh, typically tests are done at a low, mid and high flow to calculate a composite error. It's that composite error number that you, you wanna have. And this is not just useful for audit correction. Um, you can use this information when you're restructuring rates. Uh, and also when you're doing capital improvement planning, you know, we talk throughout this series about how there is uh, an intersection between asset management and water loss control. They're really kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, if you know how your meters are degrading over time, you can time their replacement better. Uh, and this is an area where, again, you and a lot of big sophisticated systems, they will pull meters after a certain volume has gone through them or after they've gotten uh, to a certain age regardless of whether they are actually uh, accurate or not, um, or whether they've been tested or not. And um, if water conditions can impact uh, you know, the, the longevity of meters significantly, um, and if you're doing periodic testing, uh, you can make better decisions about how and when you're going to replace meters. And you know, replacing meters for an entire system is a, a very expensive, uh, proposition. So, you know, this is an instance where collecting data that will be useful for your water loss control will also be very, very useful on the asset management side and capital improvement. Um, again, remember, under registered losses, apparent loss is going to increase real losses. Um, overestimated apparent losses make real losses look better. Um, but, you know, from a, an audit standpoint, apparent losses are valued much higher. So it's a good idea to get, uh, get an idea of these because when you're doing that non-revenue value calculation against the, the cost of operating your system, uh, every gallon of apparent loss is valued much, much more highly than every gallon of real loss. So you know, think about what your system's trying to do and beware of, of looking at things with rose-colored glasses. Um, on the systematic data handling errors, you've got the same issue. You know, it's a one size fits most uh, kind of uh, kind of situation. Um, if you don't have any data using the default, it's fine. But having some real data is better than than not. Um, this is another one where typically uh, most systems are using the default. Uh, I think this Tennessee number more or less uh, dovetails with national numbers. This is an area where. I think on, on a national basis, a lot of systems actually use the default as well. Again, because it does uh, take some uh, effort in digging into your systems to understand these things. And this is actually a good reason to have an IT person on your water loss control team at your utility, because a lot of times it's not just enough to know how the sort of 
front end of the billing system work, sometimes you have to be able to get into the guts uh, and understand how, how the ones and zeros are bouncing around inside the computer. Um, some thoughts on why you wouldn't want to use the defaults uh, for data handling errors. Um, these are similar to, to the earlier ones. You know, your, your billing system is your cash register. Uh, if you just continue to use the default, you're basically not looking to see whether you have a problem. Um, you know, there are two areas where uh, these errors can happen. They can happen on the collection side, but they can also happen on the, on the archive retrieval side. And again, uh, like everything else, uh, digging into this it gives you that opportunity for process improvement, examining your policies and procedures and practices, uh, and potentially getting a grade uh, higher than five, which is the default uh, default grade. Um, basically, what I'm getting at is you want, really want to know what's going on under the hood, uh, having an understanding of how your billing system works, what it does when you press certain buttons. If you give a customer a credit, uh, let's say after they've repaired a leak, uh, does it just affect the financial side of things or does that actually make water disappear in your system? Because we've seen billing systems that do that. Um, you know, uh, how uh, sure are you that all of your active users are in, in your billing system? You know, one of the systems I worked with recently had a daily reconciliation of their billing system and their GIS account data uh, to verify that the processes were being uh, applied appropriately and no set meters didn't end up in the billing system. Um, you might not have anything or have a need for something that extreme, but are you doing comparisons between the two databases to see uh, whether uh, that information is correct? And honestly, you probably should because one of the things that you need for the data for the audit is uh, a number of, of active and inactive service connections. So this would be one way to sort of kill two birds with one stone. Last thing I wanna talk about is things that typically drive action on apparent losses. You know, is it a purely financial situation or are there other factors that drive action? And quite frankly, I think it's often both. Um, to some degree, it's you know gonna be all about the Benjamins as the kids used to say, I guess, um, because there's gonna be a financial impact to everything you do. You know, the remedies are gonna cost money. Uh, the problem is costing you money. Um, but there's other factors that could come into play that might actually overshadow uh, the financial aspects of the equation. Um, and it's, even though your initial goal might be financial, there can often also be other ancillary beneficial impacts um, like we showed in our, our exercise this morning. You know, customer meters obviously are your cash registers. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're looking into those, you're looking for lost revenue. You know, when you're looking for stop meters, when you're looking for theft. Uh, um, you know, so you could be looking at your parent losses as a potential revenue stream, uh, and they often are the place that people start because if you know you can stop the parent losses, that's more money in your pocket. Uh, every billing error you can fix is 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 cash in the bank. Um, so a meter testing program and replacements uh, program main objective might be uh, recouping lost revenue uh, and you know increasing the accuracy um, by or by increasing accuracy or, or adjusting rates to account for it. But you might also be doing it because you could be bouncing up against that 20% threshold. Um, and a quick way of, of pushing that number down would be to uh, uh, you know, essentially count your consumption better. So your main motivation uh, might be increasing meter accuracy to reduce losses. Uh, and then you have the financial impact. Uh, so you know, it kind of becomes kind of a chicken and egg sort of thing. Um, you can, like I said, you could factor those apparent losses into your rates once you know how much uh, your meters are, are underperforming. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to change them all out. Um, just knowing, you know, what's going on is often uh, the ultimate goal, you know, having a, a clear picture of, of what's going on in your system. Because even if nothing is going wrong now, you know, your meters are, are or correct, your billing system is working correctly, you know, you don't have substantial systematic data handling errors. Um, that's the way things are now. That may change over time. So, you know, finding that information out right now is useful because it helps you establish a baseline. Um, and once you've got a baseline, it makes it much easier to monitor those changes over time. And essentially that's what we're doing with the audit. You know, we're year over year, we're tracking losses. And if we're using the audit as a loss control tool, um, we were comparing those changes in real and apparent losses uh, to our actions to see whether they're working or not. Um, it's really useful for streamlining your processes and, and your activities. Um, so you know, start with the low hanging fruit when you're thinking about uh, apparent losses. 
uh, recognize that there's going to be a cost associated with any loss control action. Um, and again, I think apparent losses are often a good place to start because they have the potential to put money back into your pocket uh, in, a, in, a, in a significant way sometimes. Um, but also recognize that there are going to be diminishing returns. Uh, you know, you're going to find the easy stuff first and over time, uh, interventions are going to become uh, relatively more expensive to your return. Uh, and basically what you have to look for is the balancing point. So um, as I said, start by trying to quantify those apparent losses. Uh, and once you know how big they are, then you can start making a plan. And I'm gonna hand things over to Dawn now, and she's gonna talk about component analysis, which is gonna be one of those things that really helps you quantify those losses and, uh, and determine with whether what the audit is telling you uh, matches reality. Great, thanks, James. Give me just a second here, I'll get my screen shared. All right, so as James said, we wanna take a look at each of those components of apparent loss and really do some analysis of the data that we have to understand if we should invest in reducing those losses or not. Um, so just as a reminder, the three categories, again, um, for apparent loss are uh, systematic data handling errors. And in this case, it's, you know, when we're tracking that customer consumption, particularly in our billing system is where we're going to spend some time. And then our customer metering inaccuracies and our unauthorized consumption. So we're gonna take a look at each of these different parts of apparent loss and ways that we can address them. So first is systematic data handling errors. Um, we want to understand the ways that we can introduce error into our data. And we're gonna take a look at each of the ways that are listed here and discuss how we can identify those errors. And then we want you to kind of think about your system and how you're handling data and where you might be introducing data, introducing data, introducing error into your data. Man, I'm doing all kinds of making up words today. <laughs> I apologize. So whenever we look at these four ways that we can introduce data, first we're going to take a look at how we read meters. So I want you to use your chat feature Take a look at this list of the various methods that you might be using to read your meters at your system. And then in the chat, tell me how many of those you might be using. And if you're not certain, your best guess is fine. Um, so give me some feedback of how many of these ways you use to read meters at your system. And of course we have, you know, the manual reading, the reading by touchpad or a handheld reading device, recording device, uh, mobile or a drive-by radio read, the AMR um, and the AMI meters that are available. Uh, so we've got a little bit of feedback coming in on chat. How many of these do you use? And if you just wanna give me a number, that's okay. If it's quicker than typing out the different types. So if you're using even just one method, but if definitely if you're using more than one method for reading meters, there's a good possibility that you're introducing some error every time that you read those meters. Um, and how does that happen? Well, there's a list here on the screen um, of ways that error can be introduced during that meter reading process. So we want you to take a look at this list. We want you to think about your system and how many of those read methods are being used and which of these potentials for error exist at your system. So if we look at the list that's here, um, you know, when you read your, man your meters manually, you have a misread um, or you have the transposition errors that James talked about with his one and three, um, or you have um, something that's masquerading as an automatic meter read. There's lots of different ways that error can be introduced. And so we want you to take a look and be familiar with this list. Then we want you to think about your system itself and how you're entering that data into your system. Um, so how many connections does your system have? You can use that chat function to share with us about how many connections your system has. And we want you to kind of think about that number. You've got at least as many data points each month as the number that you are sharing with me. So we've got, you know, 
754 for Tony. Thank you for sharing. 11,000 for Joseph. So thank you for sharing. Wide varieties here. Um, but for your system, you're going to have at least that many data points each month. That's a lot of data, regardless of if it's in the hundreds or the thousands or the hundreds of thousands. Um, you know, or even the millions for some of our very large systems. So that's a, a lot of data to handle and to address and to manipulate. Uh, and that can introduce error every, you know, every time we read a meter, every time we um, manipulate data. So when we think about our billing systems, all of that data has got to go from the meter read to the customer billing system. Um, and, you know, that's a, a lot of potential for mistakes um, that could be easily overlooked because it's so deeply buried. And so when we, we look at this figure that comes from AWWA's M36 manual, it does show kind of the typical steps that exist in the data trail uh, going from the meter read all the way through to the historical archive. So in each one of those steps, there's potential to introduce error. Um, and when we look at error in the data collection and the transfer and the billing and the archiving and the reporting processes, it can result in mistakes in your summary data. And that's then going to be documented um, as customer consumption incorrectly. So there's potential there for data um, error. Once the bills are created, that data is summarized and stored, and it may also be used in other places in your utility where you want to track water volume sold. Um, so when you're logging or archiving that data, again, we can introduce errors and there are many ways that error can be introduced into the reports and into the archive data. So we want you to think about your data. Is it on paper? Is it in spreadsheets? Is it in SCADA where you're tracking your consumption on a day-to-day -day basis, on a month-to-month -month basis, and then on a yearly basis? Think about where that data is coming from. Does it always come from the same source? Is it the same report? Is it the same person? Is it the same, um, you, you know, the same source? Are the assumptions that are being made the same? So if, for example, you have an operator that's reading the meter and, and logging those volumes, um, and that operator is not always the same because they don't, <laughs> don't operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, are they making the same assumptions? Or if the person that's putting the spreadsheet together, passes it off, and I'm going to use that spreadsheet now. Do I understand the assumptions that were being made in the spreadsheet by the person that created it? Maybe they're rounding. Maybe they're only looking for certain uh, usages. So the spreadsheet has some assumptions being made that I need to be aware of. How do you know which archive data is the most accurate? So sometimes we have choices where we've got two reports that supposedly say the same thing, but the numbers don't match. How do you know which one's more accurate? Well, you have to understand where that data comes from and really what it was intended for. And if it's being influenced by any of the issues that are listed on your screen right now. So for example, we've seen audits that use 364 days of data for volume from own sources, but use 365 days of data for consumption numbers or the consumption, the meter reads happen once a month. So you may get to tallying for the year and have a number greater than 365 days because we're reading once a month. That doesn't mean we're reading it on the same day every month. It doesn't mean we're consistent um, at the time of the read. So the number of days, the time of the read sometimes needs to be normalized. Uh, so understanding when those meters are read and if the data really is for a full year is one of the ways that we've seen error introduced into the audits through data handling. Uh, and we've seen that on, <laughs> on more than one occasion, probably more than, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 occasions. <laughs> so it's not a rare thing. It happens often where we don't have exactly one year of use. And that does introduce error. And then we get to policy and procedure. And we've listed here just a few examples of the ways that policies and procedures can introduce error into our data. Uh, when policies aren't really well thought out or implemented correctly, apparent losses can occur. And here, the impact is often really, really difficult to realize because it's in how we're going about collecting information. 
um, or how we're going about sharing information. Uh, so, you know, we like to say, well, that's the way we've always done it, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily working well. So, <laughs> uh, you know, policies and procedures can be really good at hiding um, error. So we need to take a look at them and think about them at times. The second component that we want to understand and analyze is the customer meter and accuracies. So we're moving into the second component now. And typically this is the biggest contributor of uh, parent losses um, from the customer meters that inaccurately measure the volumes passing through them. So in general, meter accuracy is influenced in four ways. And I kind of have a little visual here for each one of them. So first is the physical accuracy of the meter as a flow measuring device. Second is the appropriate sizing of the meter to fit the customer's consumption profile. Third is the appropriate type of meter to best record the variations in flow. And the proper installation of the meter is the fourth. So when we want to understand meter accuracy, we've got to be testing our meters. It's the only way we can understand if our meters are accurate or not. So when you think about your system, how many of you have a customer meter testing program? Do you test your customer meters? The meters do fail over time. How long the meters last can be dependent on more than just age or volume, as James mentioned, um, but also on things like water quality, pressure, all kinds of things. Uh, and then when we look at meter size, meters can be less accurate at the low end of their flow range and they can under-register use. And then meters that have more water passing through them than they are designed for will typically lose accuracy much faster. Um, so sometimes we size meters for peak flows um, because it may need to read that peak at some point. But uh, words of wisdom is that you should size them for the typical flow. And we've seen a lot of utilities that have recovered considerable water and revenue by replacing those oversized customer meters. I've also seen meters get installed based on the size of the pipe that they're gonna to connect to. So it's a six inch, six inch pipe, so it must need a six inch meter. And that's not, that's not the case. A uh, six inch pipe does not necessarily mean a six inch meter. So you have to size the meter based on the flow demands, not on the pipe. And then the meter type, we're definitely seeing advancements in meter technology. So you wanna evaluate the performance specs for any meter that you're considering um, and pick the one with a range of accuracy that meets the flow ranges proposed at the site. And finally, meter installation. If a meter is not installed correctly, it's gonna lose accuracy. So your meter manufacturers do provide specifications and guidance for the proper installation of their meters. And the utility should be following that guidance. But we've seen meters that are installed without much thought of how it's gonna impact the meter accuracy. I've seen meters installed upside down. I've seen them installed vertically. I've seen them installed right next to two elbows or a reducer. Um, and all of those things impact the meter accuracy. And then just when I think I've seen it all, <laughs> another installation turns up that surprises me. And there are lots of things that you need to consider when installing your meter. Some are related to water loss and to measuring accuracy. Um, and others are related to operations. So we have kind of a list of things that we want you to be aware of. Some are related to water loss, some not. But again, just to keep in mind that the setting needs to be plumb and level, that the meters work best in a horizontal plane, that they're readily accessible for servicing, for reading, for testing. I'm sure none of you have ever had a situation where you've had to read a meter that you can't actually access. They're always accessible and easy to read, right? <laughs> um, and then, you know, removing and installing the meter without piping or plumbing issues. I've seen situations where meters have been installed in ways that make it to where you have to cut the pipe to get the meter out. Um, and that's not what you want. You want to be able to pull that meter and test it and replace it um, or reinstall it if it, you know, if it passes the test without having piping issues. And then, of course, you want to make sure it's grounded electrically, that it's protected from freezing, that it has operational inlet and outlet valves so that you can close it off if you need to remove it, uh, that it causes minimal pressure loss, and then of course, public safety considerations. So lots of things to think about when you're picking in meters, when you're uh, deciding what meter to use uh, and how to install it. Then the third component that we want to understand and analyze, of course, is the unauthorized consumption. Uh, unauthorized consumption within a system can change over time and it can depend on a combination of things. 
Uh, it can depend on the economic health of the community. It can depend on the value that the community puts on the water as a resource. It can depend on the retail costs that you charge to your customers. It can depend on the strength and the consistency of the enforcement policies. So do you have a way to enforce uh, a policy or a practice if there is theft? And if not, then what's going to stop people from stealing water? And then the political will of the water utility management and your public officials to actually enact and enforce those policies. We've also seen that business changes can impact theft. Um, one example that we've heard of recently in the states where marijuana has been legalized, um, that as that growth opportunity increases, the water utilities can show trends of increased theft. And this has been the case in um, multiple states. We've heard from Colorado, California, Washington, that they can show trends of increased theft. Uh, another example where industry impacted theft was in America Samoa. Uh, when their ag industry was growing, they could document the fact that meters would be taken out during the watering times and put back afterwards. So hey, we're going to use some water, go pull the meter. <laughs> okay, we're done watering, put the meter back in so they don't know that we're stealing, right? And we've talked before about ways that people steal and it's, there are so many creative ways that people steal, um, you know, and that includes illegal connections, opening bypasses around customer meters, um, you know, burying or obscuring meters. The example was given of a meter being encased in concrete, so it couldn't be read. <laughs> uh, misuse of the fire hydrants or the firefighting systems where they tap the unmetered fire lines. Of course, vandalizing or meter tampering. Um, you know, illegal, uh, illegally opening the valves on the curb stops whenever the customer has been shut off for non-payment. Um, or opening intentionally closed valves to neighboring distribution systems. Uh, failing to notify the water utility to activate a billing account. You know, the list just goes on and on and on. And you guys probably have some really good examples of the ways that people get really creative with theft. Um, and if you have those stories, then chances are, you know that there is some theft in your system. So identifying that and maybe documenting that is worthwhile so that you have an idea of, you know, is it an issue at your utility or not? So you've been putting together these audits for a lot of years now and you have values entered for apparent losses and you're probably using some of the defaults and you do have apparent loss logged in your audit, but how much is it actually worth to you? So if the values of your apparent loss aren't that accurate yet, then maybe you need to invest in the data. Is some of your real loss actually apparent loss that's been misidentified? So addressing apparent losses gives the potential for payback and it acts as a springboard of success in expanding the water loss control program uh, to address your real losses through improved leakage management. So what do you do? How do you know if it's worth spending time on improving apparent loss inputs? Well, you have to gather some data. So this section focuses on that kind of bottom up approach of water auditing um, and targeted loss control functions that utilities can employ to address apparent loss. So you do the top down audit, and then you do this bottom up kind of analysis um, to target loss and to implement these control functions. So first, um, you know, there's a lot that you can do with your existing processes, but you have to understand and have confidence in your data uh, to be able to decide where you're gonna invest your time. So you need to know where your data came from, what's your data validity score, how much did you invest in determining the right score for your utility, is that score high enough that you feel comfortable taking action based on your audit? When you were developing your data validity score, were you focused on internal responses or were you focused externally on meeting the state regulations? How's your data tracked? How's it recorded? Does it allow for error to be introduced? Are policies and procedures followed? Um, so things to think about with your data before you dive into the activities. But if you feel like your data is solid and you're ready to look at the activities, there are four primary activities that you can take to analyze apparent loss data. So we've got the four steps listed here where we analyze the workings of the customer billing system. And we do this through flow charting the data. Um, it's a good way to perform an analysis. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. 
You can compile listings of basic customer account demographics. So you can look at the number of meters by size, the customer type, the consumption ranges, and you can look for anomalies such as groups of small meters that register large flows or large meters that aren't, that don't have large flows and verify that your compound meters, uh, if they don't have a totalizing register, that they actually have two accounts in your system. So you can kind of look at how things are billed and look for areas that maybe, um, you know, draw your attention kind of should be flagged. You can perform some meter accuracy testing. And of course you want that to be for a variety of your meters um, so that you establish an understanding of their status um, throughout your meter population. And then finally, you can assess a sample of your customer accounts um, for unauthorized consumption to make sure that the valves are closed that are supposed to be closed on bypass lines, so on and so forth. So here's an example of uh, your systematic data handling errors and flow charting. So when you construct a flow chart, it's a good way to see the steps that are happening and to understand where your data comes from, who uses it, what assumptions are being made. You use these flow charts to assess your billing operations um, and it allows you to understand what's working and it allows you to identify gaps that cause customer consumption to be incorrect. Once these flowcharts are completed, you can determine whether to dig deeper into your data. And this really is one area where recovering losses has an immediate impact on increasing revenue. And it should be well documented and it should be well reported saying, hey, we did this flowchart, we found this data gap, and now we're able to recover this revenue. That's great news. That's something you wanna share and, and let people know. Here's a different example of a flow chart. Uh, when you're analyzing the data handling, you wanna look at a sample of your customer accounts uh, and you wanna you know, figure out how this data is moving. You wanna think about your billing system operations, your billing data. You wanna know if the policies are rational, do written procedures exist, do the actual practices reflect the mandates for the procedures of the procedures. So, you know, sometimes we have procedures in place, but are we actually doing what we say we're doing? Um, so that's important to, to take a look at. And then the M36 manual provides a long list of other questions you want to consider when looking into your data handling uh, processes. And we've highlighted just a few of them here for you to kind of think about. Um, but there are lots of things that you can ask. When you're flow charting the customer billing system, it can be very revealing. And the process flaws, misunderstandings between different billing or between different groups in the water utility are often discovered. And oftentimes it's easy to correct these errors with inexpensive changes to the computer system by improving coordination between departments or by a change in procedures. And these operational changes don't typically require any kind of new equipment or significant staffing changes. And you can realize both water and revenue savings. So again, something to document and to share internally. The second activity you can take is to look at your meters. So you start by listing what meters you own. You make a table like the example that's given here by Emmy Simpson's company. Um, and then you can take that analysis a step farther and you can start to add the amount of revenue generated by those meters. And the more developed the meter inventory is, um, you know, the, the more information you have, but you can start simple and then kind of develop that meter inventory over time. Um, but eventually you would want it to include customer type and consumption ranges. And that will allow you to look for unexpected low flow reads or high flow reads. And there are other factors to look for when you inventory your meters, such as verifying that those compound meters have either two accounts or have a totalizing register. Um, and you, know, you wanna make sure that the, the meter multipliers that are being used are correct, that we're not missing a zero. <laughs> and we wanna check that the absolute encoder register digits are being read correctly through any automated reading equipment that's used by the utility. So that the equipment's not saying, oh, it's a thousand gallons when really it's supposed to be 10,000 gallons. Then when you're selecting a meter, of course, there are questions that you wanna ask. Is the meter accurate for the job? Is the meter accuracy acceptable? Is the cost of the meter optimal? Is the meter maintenance friendly? Can the meter be tested in place? So for many utilities, more than 50% of the revenue comes from fewer than 20% of the customer accounts. 
And these accounts are usually classified as your commercial, your multifamily, or your industrial, and they use those one inch or larger meters. So it's important that you're reviewing these accounts and ensuring that they're metered and billed correctly. So you want to have a meter testing program that helps you understand performance, um, particularly on those large meters. And you can use how much revenue they generate to determine how often you should be testing them. So there are some rules of thumb out there. Um, you know, for example, if it's generating more than $14,000 a year, you might want to test it annually. Um, if it's generating more than 7,000, but less than 14 every two years, you know, things like that. It would depend on your amount of revenue, but you can take a look and, and then decide. Of course, these are your cash registers. Um, you know, you don't want to be losing 10 to 20% of your money because you're not testing these meters. And I know we're at time. I'm almost done. So if you'll bear with me for just a couple of more minutes, we'll wrap it up. I want to make sure you get the applied activities to take with you. Um, and if you can't stick around, then um, be sure to check your email or check the website for the applied activity. Um, but thank you for sticking with me if you can. So testing in place, it's not always practical to pull a meter and test it. Um, so you may need to test in place and there are advantages and disadvantages to testing that meter in place. So you wanna take those into consideration when you're deciding on your meter testing program. Uh, some of those advantages and disadvantages are listed there. And then when we think about theft, um, what can we do? Well, we can start by um, conducting some investigations to determine if theft is a concern. So we can look into zero read meter reports. Is there a reason they should read zero? And if not, we can go take a look. Um, and there are other ways that we can learn more about unauthorized consumption that are listed on your screen. So, you know, collecting data, conducting random inspections, looking for tampering, uh, things like that. Once you've determined which, uh, if there are areas of apparent loss that you're going to look into further, then there are control measures that you can take to reduce the losses. So we're going to look at what those control measures actually are. So for systematic data handling error, you can do a billing system audit. You can do a billing system process review uh, where you look at the billing purposes versus the audit needs and you identify any mismatches in needs. You can do a field inventory. So how many meters are in the field? When you're out there reading meters, you get a count of them and you compare it to how many meters are in the billing system. And then of course, you wanna give a review to your policies and procedures. For meter control measures, this is for your customer metering inaccuracies. Of course, you wanna create that meter inventory and look at how much revenue they generate and really review those high level um, inventories. And then you can dig deeper by adding the age, the throughput volume, and you get more granular data. You can start a large meter testing program. You can start a small or a residential meter testing program. Um, and of course, you don't want to test every meter. So you need to determine how many meters need to be tested for it to give you good feedback. You can upgrade your meter reading to AMR or AMI. You can do some meter replacement. And again, of course, you want to review your policies and procedures. Then for unauthorized consumption or theft, what can we do? Well, we can collect that data, we can review those zero reads, but we can also involve our customers. We can ask them to let us know what to look for and report theft, things like hydrants, if the hydrants being used, or if they see someone out there, you know, messing around with their meter, they can report it. You can lock your hydrants. Of course, there are advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, you can designate hydrants that can be used by your contractors. Those can be designated by color, by location. Um, you can put notices on your hydrants that water used at the hydrant is theft if it's not being metered and reported. You can set your AMI system to alarm if a meter is removed. You can do random spot checks of meters. Uh, and again, of course, you want to investigate those policies and procedures. And remember that while there are these four areas where you can impact apparent loss, the volumes, the values, you first have to understand how you arrived at those numbers and if it's worth looking into it further. So if you're using the defaults because you don't have better data, it's probably worthwhile to invest in logging some data. If you haven't looked for places where data may be recorded inaccurately or where errors introduced, um, then maybe a flowchart is worthwhile. So your utility has to decide the steps that it wants to take next. But remember, we are here to help. You don't have to do it on your own. Um, so feel free to reach out to us if you've got questions. 
um, or need any assistance. So that's it for the presentation itself. We do want to share with you the applied activity so you can practice some of what you've learned. And I think James is gonna push that out into the chat right now. James, let me know if I'm incorrect. It, it is on its way. It should be in everyone's chat screen. Great, thank you. And we want you to just review those three apparent loss categories. Think about what you've learned today and determine if there's room for you to, um, you know, take some actions on apparent loss. So the handout walks you through what you've just learned. Uh, finally, just that reminder, we're here to help. We're here to help at no cost. <laughs> the state is paying for this assistance. So we encourage you to take advantage of it. James and I will stick around for a few minutes. If you've got questions for us that you haven't chatted in, we'd be happy to um, answer any questions you have. And in the meantime, our contact information is on the screen, along with our manager, Heathers, who usually participates in these activities, but is traveling today. Um, so feel free to contact us via email if you uh, prefer that over sticking around this afternoon. Thank you so much for your time, for being here, for participating in the activity. Uh, and we look forward to the next session uh, that will be in September, and that will be on real loss.